Hey, uh, how's everyone doing? Fantastic. You can give me a thumbs up. It's a pretty chill talk. You don't have to yell or anything. Uh, I'm here to talk about Concourse. I'm Alex Sirachi. Uh, sorry. I've been, at, <laughs> I've been at VMware for about, well, I was at VMware in 2011. Now I'm here at Pivotal. So it's been a while. Uh, and in the intermediate stages, we kind of learned how to write a pretty good CI system, I think, just given the crazy demands that something as big as Cloud Foundry has on pretty much every team. Like every team in the building has much different requirements. So it's a pretty good place to learn how to write a system. So Concourse is a thing that does things. So if you ever need things that need doing, Concourse is probably your guy. It does them continuously. Some people would call this a CI system, but that's sort of a specialization. It really just does whatever. Uh, this is what it looks like. This is Concourse's own CI pipeline. Um, what you can see here is sort of roughly the colored columns are the various stages as artifacts progress through. Um, the black boxes, which probably aren't very visible, but I'll show them off in the demo later. Uh, these are called resources. So this would be like a Git repo. Um, and whenever that changes, the immediate next most things will trigger. So we can see in this first column, there's about five jobs that trigger. And when they all go green, they feed into this release candidate build. Um, once we get past there, it's integration and then deploy. And then whenever we're ready, we can just come in and press ship it. And then that's when we'll actually trigger a bunch of little worker bees that publish to GitHub releases and stuff like that. Um, so obvious question is, why would we do this? There's already like 10 systems out there, at, at the very least, that can pretty much do whatever. Jenkins has been around for a long time. It's a computer. You can do anything with a computer. Um, mainly, we just got tired of being pissed off. Uh, <laughs> when you're working on Cloud Foundry, there's a lot of CI that you're dealing with. Um, it's pretty often that you'll want to just see a failing build and get to it as quickly as possible so you can actually figure out what's going on. Um, and a lot of things don't really optimize for that. You have to sort of click through and follow a chain of object models and stuff like that. And then you finally get to your console output, and then it looks like that. And you start to learn that these three question marks, that's actually a passing dot. Um, and these, this bracket 32M is actually supposed to be green. So people actually started literally copying and pasting the entire page into their terminal just so it would render the colors. Um, so that was the first thing we did. And Concourse just looks like that. So that's one check mark for us. Uh, so I'll do a quick little demo. Get the full fancy effect here. This is the status of all the teams in Cloud Foundry switching over. Um, we have a few that are already done. A lot are in flight. Um, our methodology has been sort of pair with them when it makes sense and sort of guide them through it. But a lot of people are actually just sinking their teeth in in parallel, which is kind of frightening, but pretty cool. Uh, so I can quickly go through some of the pipelines here. This is Concourse's own. I already should do that kind of. This is Diego's. Um, it's kind of interesting. They have Unit and Inigo here, just chilling. Whenever that goes green, we get a minor release candidate. Uh, bumped through, and then there's this giant thing that does a bunch of crap that I don't understand, but it's pretty cool. <laughs> uh, once it loads up. It's also a demo of the Wi-Fi, I guess. Oh, there's a password. I'm going to back out of that. <laughs> um, so that's Diego. Uh, here's Bosch Lights. Um, whenever they want to, they just come in and press a new box that'll trigger the rest of these pipelines, or these rest of these jobs. So this will build the VirtualBox image and then run bats against VirtualBox and AWS and deploy CF to it and then publish to Vagrant Cloud and then push back to master in the repo. So there's Bosch Lite. Uh, here is Bosch init's pipeline. They have a fairly simple just run unit integration, acceptance suite, bump the version number, and then ship it roughly. Here's the main Bosch pipeline. They're still working on this, but it's a pretty nice example of just basic fan in, fan out. You can see they're testing against Ruby 1.9 and uh, 2.1, and then MySQL and Postgres. So there's a lot of stuff going on there. Here's Gardens. Um, not too much different from the other ones there, I guess. It just looks different. And here's CFLAs, which is this giant hulking behemoth of automated stuff. It's pretty neat. So. One thing you'll notice is that every single team's pipeline looks very different. Um, and I think this is actually a really nice piece of information that you can collect just from sort of onboarding on a team. You can see how just fundamentally different everyone's CI works, as opposed to sort of joining, and then you have this box that's either green or red, and then you have to dig in and understand the scripts. 
Uh, one of the things Conquerors tries to optimize for is you can actually see the propagation of artifacts through the pipeline and how many stages it takes to get from changing code and then publishing. So uh, I can also show a little build here. Uh, this is Fly, this is the Conqueror CLI, and you can see here, as soon as I trigger that, we'll be cloning the Conqueror repo. And once that's all finished, which shouldn't take too long, but I'm gonna add a, little, a bunch of filler words. There we go. Uh, and then we fan out to Linux, Darwin, and Windows to run the same script, roughly. Well, switch to like .bat and stuff for Windows. Uh, and then once this all goes green, then the actual job is complete. So that's, there's not, there's not much to it other than that. Um, you can see resources, which are basically uh, the location of these source repositories. You can have like a git resource or an S3 resource, and that basically identifies how to like pull down something from some abstract location or modify it or push it up. Uh, and you can see we just have a bunch of SHAs here and metadata. And I think I've pretty much shown all the pages to Concourse <laughs> right now. So let's go back to the slides. So one thing we're also striving for is to have this be conceptually scalable, meaning um, as your needs as a team grow, you don't have like this constant need for a full understanding of your pipeline as you change and add things to it. You can just sort of piecemeal come in and say, I need a job that does this whenever this upstream logical dependency changes. You can just add that in there and the pipeline forms as a result of that. Um, and as you're doing that, there's much fewer things to think about. There's really just three core concepts. There's a resource, which I've already touched on a little bit. Uh, a resource is kind of the central focus point of any pipeline. This is where you're publishing things to and pulling from. And it's anything that can be versioned. And what that means is like I can identify some blob that will let me fetch that as it was whenever I first saw it. So for Git, that would be like a Git SHA. For S3, that might be a file name, assuming you're not clobbering your files in your bucket. Um, a task is just how to run something in a container. Um, this either succeeds or fails, and it has a set of logical dependencies. And I say logical dependencies because it's really like, you would think of this as an abstraction layer, saying my task can work with, for example, a Bosch stem cell, any old Bosch stem cell. But you might actually use it to run against an AWS stem cell or something like that. So in the task, you tend to use very generic names for the things you actually need. Um, and then you declare your other sort of concrete dependencies like which Docker image you run in, which script you're actually running, which arguments to pass, and things like that. Um, and a job is basically formed whenever you sort of meld these together in what's called a build plan. And a build plan expresses uh, various actions you can do. You can like get a resource, run a task, and then put a resource, for example. Um, and a job is just what determines the inputs and outputs, basically, for each step in the pipeline. And it's what shows up as like green or red based on its status in the main view. Um, and from that, uh, you get this nice UI. So each of these black boxes are resources. These green ones are jobs. And you can see from the indicators here that this Bosch init thing starts through here. And it's a dark gray here because no new versions will appear there. That's to convey that it's just threading the same version through the pipeline as it's past all these sort of checks and balances. Um, uh, you can have many pipelines per deployment. This is actually kind of an interesting newer thing. Um, for example, you could have a pipeline that someone just wrote and figured out the nice semantics for doing a basic Bosch release, and then you just take that and parameterize it and just shove it up on your concourse, uh, your concourse deployment. So, uh, yeah, as you're configuring th these things, we want you to be able to think about pretty much the next most thing above you and nothing more. Um, we found when we're dealing with other systems, you often have to have sort of the full topology of your CI pipeline in your head because they're all sort of strictly related. For example, you have a job that finishes and then triggers job B. Uh, whereas our intent is to have it so that you configure this job and declare the things it actually needs and which checks and balances that input should have made it through by this point, and then the pipeline forms from that. Uh, so now that you've had this all configured, um, it's nice to not worry too much about CI just burning down. I mean, stuff happens, a VM goes away, all of your VMs go away, depending on your infrastructure. Uh, and it's nice to be able to just say, I have this configuration, make it so, bring it back. Um, which is a matter of making it so that you're never configuring your workers, you're never like hand tweaking them, going in there, adding like apt dependencies or anything like that. Um, 
There's also no like GUI for con configuring pipelines. Um, instead, you just have this one document that says, here's my pipeline, put it up there with the parameters. Um, that's to avoid like when you actually bring it back, you don't have to click through for two hours just to bring your jobs back and hope they were exactly how they were. Um, it's very, uh, we at least want to be minimally uh, re reproducible via Bosch. We'll add easier ways to do it in the future. We have Vagrant already, which works for a local thing. There's Vagrant with AWS, but there's no credentials, so I wouldn't recommend that. Um, so yeah, our mode is very much like solve for Bosch, get everything reproducible and fitting with our guidelines, and then we'll sort of add UX on top of that to make it a lot nicer to bootstrap. Um, and there's also the fact that because builds are just run in a container, they're, they should be much more reproducible than they would be if you had like state on some agent, one of 20 agents. Um, you can take the same configuration you have for an individual build and just run it from the command line. Um, which is great for seeing like something failed up there, let's reproduce the inputs or try changing the code locally and then run the exact same thing in the CI system but not as part of the pipeline because I'm just trying to debug something. Um, there's also, we've been hiding away various CI state like build number um, from the tasks intentionally and this is because when so we've seen this pattern of like using the build number for versioning. Um, what can happen is your master rolls over and then your versions start over at zero unless you do something about it, so that gets really awkward. So we push that out into what's called a Semver resource, which externalizes all that state and makes it so that truly if anything really bad happens, you can just come back and still be on version 2.0 instead of 0.0.1. Um, and I've touched on resources a little bit. I mentioned Semver resource just now, um, git s3. The main goal of these guys is to make it so you can delete all your boring crap, all your boilerplate that you have in your pipeline for like doing branch promotion or promoting an asset into a bucket. Um, instead, there's this notion of a resource, which is truly this very abstract notion of something. Um, the, one of the more interesting things is a, it's a thing that you can linearize. So like with Git, that would be a sequence of SHAs and which SHA I'm currently on and which SHA I can check from. Uh, for S3, this would be like objects in a bucket with versions in their file name, so we can actually pull down the exact same one again. Um, and a lot of the first class things that are in other systems like timed triggers or like cron things, we actually try to find a way to just push these into resources so that we can keep the core small and drive out more uh, genericness, I guess, in the resource interface to sort of prove it out. And these are really the only way you can extend concourse. Um, which I actually think is a good thing. I like to be able to trust that there's just this one interface that I can deal with and everything else is just sort of pretty much how I need it. I don't have to worry about how two plugins interact with each other or anything like that. So what is a resource? Uh, today, resources have three actions. There is get, which is I have this version, so like a get SHA, and I need this as an input to a build. So that would basically look like git clone the repo and then check out that SHA. Um, put, is how you create versions. So you would have some output. This would be like arbitrary artifacts. And then you would modify some external thing, like put something in a bucket, and then return a version. And that version would get you back what was put up there. And there's check, which is how we discover these versions. It starts with either nothing, if it's a brand new thing and we've never seen it before, or the current version. And that gives us the sequence of versions. Um, so yeah, here's all the examples of the git thing. Uh, it's just clone, sort of push, and then pull and log. So for Git, it's very straightforward. For other things, you have to work with version, num version numbers and file names in S3, for example. But we found this to be very extensible. And this was actually like the first mind-blowing thing that we ran into. This is like after a late night chatting with Dimitri on how to pull Git core stuff out of concourse and generalize this. And as soon as we realized that, it was like, this is going to be pretty freaking cool. Uh, and as following on that, um, these are all of today's resources. Um, there's a lot more plans for more coming in the future. Uh, there's Git repos, which is the very common one. S3 is actually really common too. Uh, you can use this to perform CI for Docker images, so you can pull them whenever they change or uh, create them whenever their source changes. Um, Bosch deployment resource is a great way to automate a Bosch deployment. Uh, there's a few subtle advantage advantages to this. One is it's code that you don't have to write. Two is it's just uh, parameters that you don't have to carry around anything for. And uh, the other sort of nice thing is it guarantees that the inputs, 
in terms of like the releases and the stem cells are the exact version that gets deployed. So you don't have latest sort of sitting around in your manifests, not doing what you think it's doing. Uh, and there's sort of other various odds and ends. Um, and one of the nice things about running in containers, uh, well, one of the not nice things, sorry, is they can be pretty far away and hard to debug in that case. I imagine a common workflow today is if you have a build that's hanging or failing in some awkward way, you have to SSH into the machine and figure out what's going on there, but at least you can do that. When it's in a container, you have another, another sort of step between there. So what we've done is added a way to run builds locally, so you can at least run them with your own inputs. So say you're modifying code on disk and want to see if this actually breaks it the way you think it does, and that this runs with the exact same semantics as the pipeline would, which gives you the guarantee that it's doing uh, what it probably will do when you push it up there. Um, and there's also Fly Hijack, which lets you hop into the container of a running build. So this is great if you have something that's stuck and you want to actually figure out what's going on. You can just hijack in there, uh, send SigQuit to the thing, get a stack dump or whatever your actual system does. Um, it's fully interactive. You can run whatever command. Um, typically, you just do bash and mess around in there. Uh, fly Configure is how you actually shove a pipeline configura configuration up there. Uh, you just give it the name of the pipeline, which YAML file, and another file which you can use to provide secret credentials. That way you can make your pipelines public. Um, and before you actually commit it, it'll tell you what's changed, so you can confirm it. Um, so that's pretty much all there is to Concourse, I think, itself. So uh, the rest is sort of nitty gritty, little low level details about it. Um, every container runs uh, via Garden. Uh, the main advantage of that is we can just use the same code and work with Windows and Darwin and Linux, like I mentioned before. Um, the workers are entirely stateless, which means whenever you have to scale up, it's just change the number in your Bosch deployment manifest and Bosch deploy. You never have to worry about, do these new workers have the same state as the other ones? Are my builds going to randomly start failing if they run on those? Uh, instead, everything's just homogenous. We randomly run builds across all the workers. Um, so that's all you should really have to think about. One other kind of interesting subtle detail is in a lot of systems to register sort of esoteric workers, like you say you have some vSphere cluster in the office or you're running in some private network, uh, a lot of the time you have to make a VPN to actually reach those workers, uh, which is a formula for a lot of pain from what I've seen. The VPN can just sort of fall over and then your workers are orphaned. Um, it also means your CI needs access to your private network, which is a little dangerous. So instead we reverse the flow of the tunnel and just have the workers SSH into the master that way, the only thing that needs to be able to happen is your workers can reach your public CI server, which is much more likely. And then that's just over a secure SSH session. Um, every component, except for Postgres, if you count that, you could just use RDS, I guess, is highly available. Um, ATCs can be scaled up arbitrarily. Um, they do a pretty rough job of scaling the workload out, but it's pretty decent, I guess. It speeds up the web UI, and it's mainly about, like, being able to deploy itself without going down, which is an interesting venture. <laughs> um, everything is written in Go. Uh, it's probably no big surprise there. Um, one of the nice side effects is it's theoretically very low footprint. We haven't actually looked, but I'm going to brag about it anyway. Um, <laughs> uh, the nice thing about the resources being pulled out is you can actually use whatever language makes sense for them. You don't have to like write your plugins in Go because the API is in Go. You don't have to write your thing in Java because Jenkins uses a Java. Um, they are just a set of binaries in a container. So you can use Ruby or Bash or Go or whichever language you want to as long as you control your own dependencies because they're just Docker images and that's fairly easy to reproduce. Uh, there's nothing too shocking on the front end. Uh, we use React.js for rendering the builds, which, which actually saves a lot of the performance and a lot of the complexity. The main UI is D3-ish. Uh, it's really just we're using it to draw. We actually determine everything statically. Uh, there's some fun problems, though, if you want to do pull requests or something. Because the main UI is, uh, despite looking like this clean thing, it's actually very tricky to figure out how to lay these out so there's like as few lines are crossing. There's this one, which is killing me, but we never found a good way to do that. Uh, <laughs> I promise you this is a very hard problem. One of the constraints that uh, makes it hard is the lines have to come in on the same side that they come out, otherwise it's fairly simple. But given that, like, if, even if we were to fix these, it would like, flip these over and weird stuff would happen over here. It's crazy. So 
try to avoid that problem. So that's not it. There we go. Uh, everything is open source. It's on github.com slash concourse. Uh, we have docs up at concourse.ci. They should be up to date. They might not be good, but they're up to date. Um, <laughs> Uh, the docs go over how to do a Vagrant up and a Bosch deploy. Uh, they assume some Bosch familiar, familiar, yeah, some familiarness with Bosch, uh, but mainly because they're not good enough. Uh, yeah, we're on Concourse on Freenode. Feel free to come in. We're usually there at least 24 hours a day. Not, not all of us at the same time, but someone's in there. Uh, so have to get to the caveats. We're not 1.0 yet. Uh, occasionally we. I won't, I won't say break things because we give you a path forward at least, but read those release notes because you'll probably have to do something at some point to actually upgrade. Um, just broke my sorry. <laughs> There's no caching, so if you have a bunch of large artifacts, um, it will clone them every time, but at least it's not polluting or sharing state. We'll be doing caching pretty soon, probably in the coming weeks. Uh, we'll be making sure to also keep it so there's no weird pollution possible. Um, and yeah, I mentioned read the release notes. It's worth saying again, we're still thinking through some of the core principles. Uh, we're mostly there, but occasionally we have to sort of subtly change how things like build plans work. But uh, everything should at least have a transition path. So uh, that's pretty much it. Any questions? Tamar? Sure. Uh, if you want a giant example, uh, the concourse repo has our pipeline config public. Um, obviously, with all their credentials uh, stripped out. If I can find it. Yeah, I tried. <laughs> Should be in there. Oh, thank you. <laughs> oh, boy. Cross your fingers. Make the Wi-Fi signal. <laughs> Come on. If I open it in five tabs, usually one of them loads. Or not. <laughs> uh, uh. No? You might have to trust me on this. <laughs> oh, wait. I have the code. Wait, 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 wait. Crush. Hold on, hold on, we're almost there. Wait for it. Wait for it. Okay. <laughs> CI, pipelines, concourse. That should be big enough. Uh, so let's look at fly, which is the one I showed you earlier. Uh, this is the one that triggered, that triggered both Linux, or all of Linux, Darwin, and Windows. Um, the job config itself, first off, just says that it's public. Um, this is the thing you do if you actually want your pipeline to be open source. You can also make it publicly viewable for the whole thing, but that just means um, you can view the pipeline, but you can't drill into the job until they say public true. So that's just an extra safeguard, because it's very easy to accidentally leak credentials, especially in like a Bosch deploy. So. Um, so every job just has a single plan. This plan says pull down the concourse resource, which is defined further below with git stuff, and then do this aggregate step of running Linux, Darwin, and Windows. And each of these are saying run this task uh, using the config located in concourse slash CI, concourse being the step that we pulled from. Um, and I can bring those up, but I'll quickly jump to resources as well so I can show you how concourse is defined. One of these. There he is. Uh, so this just says it's a Git resource. It lives at this Git URI. The branches develop and use this private key, which we parameterize in. Um, so you would define a resource for really all the logical dependencies, which is why we have one for uh, master, one for develop. But we also have this concourse develop thing, which is pretty much the same thing. but. Uh, you would basically duplicate config when you have a separate logical resource, and meaning like you use it differently, um, that just happens to live in the same repo, uh, which is one of the first things that 
we should probably update in the docs because a lot of people trip up on that. Uh, here's all the configuration for uh, things that we put in S3. So you configure S3 with the bucket that the objects live in, uh, the regex matching the file name. You use this capture group to figure out the version number from the files in the bucket. That way we can order them. Um, and there's a semver resource which currently lives in an S3 bucket and this is so we can manage our actual semantic bumping and things like that. Uh, so to show the task config, there's fly Linux. Uh, this is the configuration for our Linux build. And this says use this Docker image, uh, concourse slash ATC CI. I have one logical dependency and that's concourse itself. And I'm gonna run this script um, in my platform as Linux as opposed to Darwin or Windows and any of these. Uh, Windows, pretty much the same. There's a dot bat though, so it's Windows. And it says platform Windows. Um, Concourse's pipeline is kind of big, might be a bit intimidating. Uh, I think there's a few more coming out. Bosch is doing a big transition and they're making all their pipelines open source, so that's a great information, that's a great source of information on like some of the simpler flows of like I just have this CLI, I need a binary that goes to uh, S3 or something. So, any more? No more questions? Oh, over there? Sure. Uh, everything is a Bosch deployment. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, how do you scale your CI cluster? Um, given that we lean on Bosch heavily for managing our, uh, each of our jobs, uh, ideally it's just change a number in your manifest. Not even ideally, pretty much practically. That's all we've ever had to do. Um, you can scale up workers pretty easily. We'll just randomly go between them. You can scale up ATCs. That's mainly for high availability, though. So. Uh, yep. Uh, it's, it would be pretty easy to deploy at least ATC, which is the web UI. Um, all it needs is Postgres. There's no like message bus or anything other than that. Um, the tricky thing is the workers, because a lot of the time you need actual full privileges to run those. Um, I did do one experiment at least where I deployed the workers to uh, Lattice, just using privileged containers, and then just had the workers all register with some other thing that was running in there and pointing at RDS. Uh, in principle, we could just have a big public stateless worker pool uh, and turn off privileged. And then we have sort of a multi-tenant worker pool, but you can just see if push the web UI, which would be at least more convenient. So, any more? Back there. So it sounded like you had uh, just images that you were creating if, if, uh, if like your build, um, well, my question is, <laughs> if you have like dependencies for your build, things you need to install, mm -hmm. are you always downloading it and installing it? Uh, it sounds like you have very generic uh, terms Sure. Um, what you would usually do is pre-build a Docker image for your builds um, and put all your actual sort of static dependencies in there. If you have something that's more, dyna but more dynamic, you would probably pull it down at runtime uh, as long as it's not too slow. A lot of times you end up just optimizing and putting it into the image because once we fetch it, it's pretty quick to boot up because it's all cached. Next one. Not seeing any. I guess we're good. Cool. Thank you.